Hey everybody, it's Gordon and I'm here on our Stanley Hand Plane Tote Repair video series. This is going to be video number two and today we're going to keep it short and simple. I'm going to go right for the horn and we're going to talk about a Brazilian rosewood repair where we're going to just uh, do some work on the, on the horn, if you will, or up at the very top. Very common uh, fracture in our candidate today <clears throat> is, uh, is a Brazilian rosewood and it has been in service for quite some time because you see a little bit of um, you know TLC and sweat and, and wear on the handle here up at the top where someone's just been using it as is which is fine so we're going to bring him back to its original shape and uh, and I'm going to show you how we do that so um, what you'll notice already is that I have affixed or glued this tote to a little sled it's a sacrificial piece of material and I just tacked it in place and there is some purpose to why it's why it's here uh, number one would be safety we want to make sure that as we're going to run this through the saw that we're holding on to it and it's stable um, you know as it as it exists by itself there's no real flat surfaces other than the bottom and so it could be difficult to hold on to so one thing that I wanted to share with you is how I hold on to these and uh, that's it right there there's no secret we're just going to hot melt glue it. And I'm going to put a lot more on here, but he's just been tacked in place. <clears throat> so um, before we get into it, <clears throat> I want to talk about this uh, objective, where we're going with this repair. And you'll notice that that fracture is right through the mounting hole uh, in terms of like the face of a clock. It's right through three and nine o'clock. And we have to make a decision on how we want to conduct this repair, or what our objective is. We can simply clean and dress the surface to open up the pores of the material so that we get a good bond. And we can do that pretty much right where it is, and that's okay. We're going to choose our material, and I'll talk about that in a second here. But I need to know ahead of time, as you're, as you're um, walking through the repair, do we want to cover the entire horn? Are we going to you know, do a full top replacement? Are we going to just replace the tip? And there's pros and cons to each. <clears throat> so... I'll use this one as an example. This is a rosewood tote with a walnut repair. The fracture was more significant and there was much more missing. So you could see it was cut clean off and then the entire top was shaped accordingly. And then you have to redrill the hole and then placement's really important. Whoop, let's get up my camera. Placement's really important and we need to, to basically put this in, um, you know, replace that hole again. And that's done from the back. So. The geometry is already there. I'm not worried about the placement so much, but when we replace this complete and there's nothing there to work with, it can be more of a challenge. So let's look at maybe this guy, for instance. Okay, so if we're talking about something where um, you've got no location uh, for that final geometry, it's a little bit uh, unnerving as to how we're gonna put that in there, make sure that it's centered properly and the depth is there and everything's right. So, a complete top repair like this one um, is a little bit more challenging. What we could do <clears throat> is we're going to square this off and still leave part of that cylinder exposed. That's going to help us with registration. We'll know that it's there. We're not going to move it or, or depth, you know, change the depth or do anything to it. But what we do cover, we can still then remove easily, and it kind of brings us right back to our, our original geometry. Why that really matters is because, you know, we're, we're perfectionist in what we do and we're really worried about appearance and you want to just kind of plan it ahead of time so that we understand what our goals are. So in this case, here's another one. This is Brazilian Rosewood with a repair. And if I look close, because I know the repair, you can see that it was cut very similar to this guy, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut him right at three and nine o'clock. So we're gonna leave part of the hole exposed. That's what was done here. And we left part of that exposed so that replacing that cylinder and putting the geometry back in was easy for us. Now, again, under certain light, you can tell we're never trying to hide this or make it go away completely. You can tell that there's some laminations here and there's some other material in place. And again, under the right light and close inspection, um, we can be super picky and talk about the joinery and look at how it was, how it was repaired. From a glance or from a user point of view or from you know three feet away as it's on my desk on my bench and we're putting this to use uh, i think that's a beautiful repair and a lot of good years to come so 
All I'm trying to do is say, we need to know what we're gonna cut and how. So we put this on a little sled. I'm just using hot melt glue, and I wanted you to see that we're just gonna fill it right up, right? I wanna make sure that that stays. I don't want my part to come loose. Glue is real easy to, uh, once it's cooled, right? And once we get under here, we can snap this back off its little mounting plate and not worry about it at all. So there's no damage. I'm not screwing or clamping or squeezing. Um, it's super easy to sticky this guy down and then take it right to the saw. So let's head to the saw. Okay, so we're at the saw and I've got this set up uh, with no guards just for you uh, to see what's going on here, but I'm not gonna run it like this, of course. So we've got our, our tote attached to a sled and then uh, it's parallel and uh, I'm using a zero clearance insert to make sure that any little debris or any wedges that fall off our cut uh, don't become pinched on the blade. But our goal is to cut this surface. We want to remove this dirty and uh, contaminated surface and end up with a nice clean flat area that we can bond our new horn onto. So here we go. So once we've made the cut, it looked just like this with the guards on and as we made that pass, we made a nice clean pass and look at what we end up with. And this is our goal here, of course, is to have a surface that is free of contaminants, the pores are open, and that's uh, free of oils and dirt and it's gonna give us a beautiful surface to bond to. So we were a little bit below our three and nine o'clock, which is okay still, I'm gonna be fine with it. If you really wanted to continue, to take additional passes, we could bring it right down and cover the hole completely. But I'm just gonna leave this one for the sake of our video. Um, let's just keep right on moving. I think it's gonna look wonderful. So one of the things that I did prior to starting too, and right before I glued this down, was I traced it on some graph paper. And just to kind of give myself an idea what I'm going for for a horn. As you know, with the different Stanley types and different vintages, there are some different geometries that are going on out there. So again, in a, as a matter of planning ahead, I like to, to uh, understand or have a roadmap on where we're headed. And so our little repair is gonna take place and we know what the shape is gonna be. Now I just need to find a piece of material that's gonna be suitable or match to our liking. So we have choices. We can go domestic and we can put something super crazy on there or we can just work with Brazilian rosewood right from our Stanley donor box, or we can bring in some other exotic. So if you, again, have seen my earlier videos, you know that I do have a collection of what are known to be Brazilian rosewood samples and donor parts from hand pines. There's some white wood stuff in here too, of course, but some of these are clearly Brazilian rosewood. In this case, um, we're not going to draw out of our box. We're going to look at some of the other things. And just for, again, for the sake of the video, I want to share with you um, some of the other things that I'll do. And that would be uh, purchase different materials. We've got Indian rosewood and we have Brazilian. Maybe we don't. We're not going to say. We might have some Grenadillo or might have some uh, like a Bolivian rosewood. So. There's some different species here on the table. Uh, I'll see if we can give you a little bit better angle of what's going on. And you'll also see, I'm gonna reveal another one of my secrets, is that not everything has to be from a hand plane. So at times, I will tell you, I might be wandering around in an antique store, and if we can find something that is uh, gonna be donor material, and it finds its way into a hand plane tote, then so be it. So off with the rabbit's tail, he goes. But for this project, we're gonna work with, uh, let's, do a, let's do a Bolivian. So we're gonna choose a Bolivian rosewood, and I like the grain, and if we kinda lay this over, you can start to see what's going on here in terms of color and end grain. I like the end grain on this. I think this is gonna match up really nice. So I believe that our little horn donor for this video is going to come right off of this piece of Bolivian. Okay, so we've prepped our little replacement part. We know that this is going to be our new horn. We're going to use a Bolivian rosewood. I am paying attention to the grain a little bit. And again, it's not always perfect and it doesn't always uh, turn out to be exactly what you want it to be. But I'm following the same arcuate shape 
in terms of the end grain. And I'm trying to get some same color, I like the black streaks in here. It's going to give me a little bit of contrast. And this is where we're going to go. So planning, planning, planning. Just take your time to do a dry setup and understand what your goals are. And you're always going to have better results. Um, so here's where we're going. We're going to glue this guy together. I'm going to use Tight Bond 2 for this one because we're using a super clean surface, very flat. Um, it's not necessarily going to be a high structure area, but it's going to be a superior bond. And um, I just wanted to use one of the different four adhesives that I use uh, for this video. So I'm going to go with Tight Bond 2. There's my adhesive. We're going to go with the, the TB2. What we're going to do is we're going to butter this guy up so that we have um, a good glue surface. And then we're going to clamp it in place. And I'm just going to use um, Bessie clamps because I'm trying to stay in the mainstream where not all of us are going to have pattern maker vices or have you know fancy ways to attach or fixtures made. But this is going to be a simple glue up. I'm going to show you how, how easy this is. So this is our objective. We want to do this. We want to have uh, our glue in there. But I don't want... Um, this necessarily to glue itself all together. So I do a couple things here and let me see if I can explain this very quickly. First of all, I'm using a scrap piece of plywood and it's the same as my sled. So those are the same thickness. If I were to just put my block on here and push this in, you'll see that I'm proud right here. My block is higher and I'm essentially making this a perfectly flush setup on the back side over here and I don't want that. I want to give myself a little bit of material. So two things have happened. One is I've already run my sled back across the table saw and if you look really close you'll see that I removed some of this material so that it's not in the way of my bond. I've got a nice flat surface here. It's super clean and that's going to give us the best uh, adhesion possible. I've also taken a little bit of material out of the way so that we get good clamping pressure. Now, if I put this on my bench and they're the same height, I'm going to take away my opportunity to sand and to fit this. And I'm very particular and I'm stingy on my materials because these are um, valuable and I don't want to just, you know, glue a big brick on here and then sand away 70% of it. So as you can see, I'm a little bit uh, stingy when it comes to uh, cutting my stock. So I need this to be proud on both sides so that I can blend this in and we have some room to sand. So how do I do that? All I'm going to do is lift this guy up and I really only need it to be about this much thickness. So I'm going to put a piece of sandpaper down, put my material back on. So now he's at a little bit higher elevation. I'm just going to clamp it to my bench so that it stays in place. Now when I push this material up to it and I push this block against there, it's centered better. Okay, so I've got a little bit of proud here and I know that I'm a little proud on the back side. Yay me. Okay. So that's what we want to do. We're going to get our glue on here and then we're going to clamp this guy this way. And because I'm using all my straight and parallel surfaces, it gives me great pressure and a really easy way to hold this thing together. So again, we're taking the complexity out of it. Take the geometry and all the complex curves out of it. And uh, let's do it that way. If you don't want to use a, a quick grip type, I also have um, a screw clamp and this will also give us some pressure. You want to be careful not to squeeze all of the adhesive out, right? We're going to apply a fair amount of pressure to this, um, and, but we want it to stay and we're going to leave it overnight. So let's kind of clamp everything down. It's all held in place. I'm ready to go. I like my setup. I like the grain orientation. I like the material. So here we go. I don't sand these surfaces too, by the way, because as I said in my little outtake, um, when you sand the material and all those little microfibers, you're pushing those into the grain. If you don't clean that out well, you potentially affect your bond. So I like what we have going right there. I'm gonna use a screw type clamp. And apply moderate pressure and I'm pressing down because I know all my elevations are right and I can't go wrong. This whole thing is stuck to my bench and we're gonna leave it and we're gonna pick this video back up in the morning 
And uh, again, it's a quick bond. I know that you know you can work with this stuff. I think on your instructions, it'll tell you that it'll it'll tack within 30 minutes. Um, but clearly, we're going to be doing some um, some work there, and I don't want to pop that off, so I leave it 24 hours. So I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, so fast forward to day two. We've let this dry for 24 hours, so we're going to give it uh, a little look. See, see what we've got, and. Again, um, we've got a nice bond there. And if you wanted to test it, now would be a great time to do that before we start getting into carving. But as you can see, I just popped this right off. I didn't even use a razor blade or a sharp chisel because I don't want to get into my rosewood. So the glue is enough to hold it and keep us safe when we're running the saw, but it also is forgiving enough to let go. So there's our bond. And this is, again, this is tight bond two. We put a piece of uh, Bolivian rosewood on top of our Brazilian rosewood. And now we need to kind of pencil out where we're going. And I did end up wasting a little bit here. Uh, I changed my choice on grain uh, as we were cutting out our little sample. But there we have it. A great bond. So we've got a couple options to get our uh, shape drawn onto this block. And one is, if you remember when we first started, we uh, did some sketches. So I have some graph paper and we can lay it out on a piece of graph paper with a little template. Or if you're fortunate enough to have something else, something similar, I'd like to do this too. Let's go right to a reliable source and that is another tote that has uh, a really good profile, really good history. So. This is what we're gonna do. Let's set that guy. And I, I like to have one nearby too because it serves as a good reference if you're kind of a visual person or a spatial person uh, as you're carving and, and you know bringing this guy into shape. Um, that's a good reference for us. So you have options to cut out your final shape. Uh, jeweler saws, coping saw, band saw if you have one. And this was my waist. And I've actually uh, probably got enough on there for another tote, another little horn. So this goes in the scrap box. We're going to hold on to him for later, and, uh, and we're on our way. Next, I want to shape this top and kind of follow my line, get rid of my glue line here, and without removing uh, as much or any of the rosewood, we want to try and get our, our final shape on the top, and then we can sh trace uh, the oval shape and kind of give it some curvature. Okay, so at this point, I am going to move to just hand tools. So I like to use uh, a combination of files and rasps to help kind of dial this in. And it's about touch and, uh, and having a good feel for what's going on here. So again, I'm not going to use a pattern maker's vise or anything special. I'm going to work just uh, hopefully like you would at home. And I'm just going to clamp this down and hold on to it, um, you know, so that I have uh, something to work on. And I like to stick it off the end of my bench of course because we're going to start to shape this thing in a word of caution would be of course you know these this is a solid tote there weren't any cracks or any base issues with it however i don't want to create those either so i will tell you just the slightest little impurity or something on your bench for instance if i had this little glue glob under here and i set this down and i squeeze it i'm going to crack this thing and it's going to break right in half Okay, so I do pay a little bit of attention. You'll see me getting a little bit physical with my parts, um, but I want you to know that there's some finesse going on there too. So we do want to make sure that we're holding on to it. I also use a, a urethane bed sometimes or something soft to put underneath so that we can squeeze and kind of mold this and hold on to it tighter. But again, for the sake of the video, I'm kind of fast forwarding through these steps so that you get the idea. But here's where we are at the moment. So. Hand filed, I've kind of brought this in. I've touched the surface of the rosewood a little bit because we're really going to want a good smooth transition point here. And you can see we still have the hole exposed, which is going to be to our benefit because we're going to bore that back out. At some point, and I'm getting to that point very soon, what I'll do is I'll take an existing tote and we'll match it up nose to nose and then we'll just trace it. We'll basically roll that footprint right back up here and then kind of get an idea and whether or not that's what we're looking for. The one that I've cut out is a little bit longer. I'm extending this just a little bit. It's just a matter of preference. 
trying to give it a little bit of balance. But that's how we're going to find uh, this arcuate shape or the, the curvature overall. And as you can see, my scrap is a little proud on this side. It's a little proud on this side, which is great. That's going to minimize the amount of filing that we need to do. Um, but let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to put him back out, make sure we're cleaned off here. I'm going to stick him out to about there. And we're going to squeeze him and hold on to him. Get that glue off of there. We'll start to dial in that seam. Make a really nice transition. Now I have this kind of a raised portion here. We want to put that radius back in there. So I move to an older Stanley. Why am I using a metal file, right? For one, I'm using a card file too. So I have a brush and I'm gonna keep these, uh, the, the surface of my file clean so that I can get a good cut. But by using something rigid and metal, I'm able to use the touch and the feel of my hands and also level the surface out. If I were to use a block of wood or a sandpaper, for instance, with my finger, you're going to conform to the surface and if you have misaligned surfaces or if there's a ridge there you're just going to kind of sand with it and you're removing all of the material so kind of think along the lines of body shop right by using something rigid and working along this line i'm able to get a really nice blend and my tool is not going to conform to the surface the surface is going to conform to my tool and what i'm looking for there is that straight line so I'm looking for a seamless cut. And this guy's starting to take a little bit of shape. And we're removing um, the overlap and trying to kind of blend in our glue line right there. So again, patience, right? We're taking our time. This isn't a race. Take a nice little pass. We can always remove more. It's more difficult to add material back in. In fact, if I screw this up, I'll probably cut it off before I try and blend it in or add or wedge or do whatever. So just taking our time. And then also remember that scratch, right? The biggest scratch in the, the process of improving your finish is progressively a finer scratch. So I'm using a fine file because I don't want to have to sand and work this surface. So I'm leaving this a little bit smaller scratch. Okay. So let's progress check. Let's see where we are. We have filed the top. We've got a nice flowy top across the top surface. I like that. And then I've just tried to clean up my glue line to get as close as I can without taking away any rosewood. You can see we've got some little bruising and some scuffs and stress marks going on back here. That's okay. And then we've done a pretty good job here. Now, I didn't really spend any time on this horn on the far tip because it's going to be removed. We're going to round that off. So I was really focused on just trying to eliminate any flat lines because I love the totes that have all these beautiful curves and flowy surfaces and that I'm going to try and eliminate any flat spots that I have. So obviously this black uh, or the blocky big uh, back end here has got to go away. So that's my next step. So what I'll do is let's just clamp him to the bench 
so we don't knock it down. And we're gonna adjust real quick. And we're gonna end up about here. So I like to just take as a reference another tote if we have one, and we do. And I'm just gonna put him right on here like this, kind of use that as a master and I'm going to roll him back to about here. And I said I wanted to extend this one a little bit. So again, why do I do that? Because we can always take material off. It's difficult to add material back on. Not something I want to be charged with at this point in our project. So we're just going to kind of trace it in like that. At a glance, it's looking kind of flat on the sides and looking like a big thumb. So this is gonna be your work as you do this for yourself and you can do whatever you want with it. That's the beauty of where we are right now. I think we're at the art form uh, of the process, not so much the technical form. We're not gonna be cutting these on CNC and we're not gonna be going to a coordinate measuring machine. We're not gonna be putting calipers on it. It's really gonna come down to what looks right and what has a nice flowy natural feel to it so at this point you could nip these off again with your dovetail saw or take a bigger step if you want belt sand it uh, I'm gonna go ahead and rasp these off and then I'll dial it in by hand okay let's see where we are so we've used a rasp of course I knocked off the big stuff right and I'm taking off as much material as I can and kind of sneaking up on it and then I'm just using my simple file to bring that in to what I think looks uniform and it looks straight with the toe. Now, this is personal preference, but I like to taper the tip just a little bit. If we keep the flat sides and keep those parallel, it just starts to look like a big thumb to me. And here's an example. I don't love this, but this is a walnut. And even though it measures fine, it just looks like that's a lot of horn up there, right? A great big, maybe if you've got big mitts and you like that kind of a shape. Fine, but I'm gonna go for a little bit more taper, a little more elegance, and we're gonna kind of taper it back. And uh, now that we've done that, let's take a look, see where we are. Okay. So we brought our glue line in, looks pretty good. And we've done our top surface, looks pretty good. And now you can see we've got this blocky shape and we need to kind of round this up and kind of blend it in. Now this is done by hand again because I just think there's something about a tote that looks right and a tote that looks wrong. And it's gonna be personal preference and this is where your styling comes into play, right? You have the ability to work with this and shape it to what you uh, feel looks uh, appropriate. So I'm going to try and put that radius on here next. And a lot of times I'll just clamp this guy upside down and stick that thumb out off my bench just like this. And that's going to give us a lot of room. Again, I'm not working in a vise. I'm trying to treat this just like you would with minimal tools at home. Okay, so we're going to flip the angle around just for a second so you can see what I'm doing. And this is where lighting really just comes into play. Um, and again, I'm a huge advocate for files because I think that that file is going to take away any high spots. It's not going to just conform, um, you know, to the surface. So I like being able to knock off high points. I'm just kind of using my hand to see and feel my way through this. And a little bit of light reflection. And don't be afraid to use water. I'm just going to grab a water bottle and uh, kind of wet that surface. It'll raise the grain a little bit, but that's okay. We can take that right back off and that will expose if there's any glue squeeze out or if our joint has any issues. Kind of lets us help see what's going on there. And I see that we could remove a little bit more right in here in that web area. Like the way this is taking shape so the original finish on the rosewood is also there 
and we'll start to see that in terms of a smear. If we sand at this point, and I would roll up uh, a spongy, like a 3M soft sand, with, you know, put it behind some paper so we get a nice little roll up like this. And now we're at that point where we can start to kind of shape this in. And I'm just gonna lightly sand with the grain to remove and not create those cross grain scratches. And now I'm starting to see our final shape take place. We've got a really nice blend. Okay, I like where we are. It really didn't take that long. Let's see what we have. We could probably smooth this out in the where my hand goes a little bit. We'll touch that off with some sandpaper. Now, the next discussion that we might have is, you know, how much do you want to do to the rest of this tote? It's really, it's got some uh, patina, if you will. It's got some battle scars along there. I like those. So we're really, again, we're not trying to make this brand new and make all our repairs disappear. Clearly we're using a different species of wood as we replace this horn, and that will be very obvious, it'll be evident. So I don't think there's any reason, and I don't really want to take away from the original shape of this, so I don't really see any reason to dig down deep and try and remove these. Fill in them is certainly going to just start to look like a Dalmatian if we did that, and I don't want to do that either. So I say we clean this guy all up and take an initial look at it and see how well we did and then we can talk about punching that hole out. So in short order, we have come to our final step. And one of the things, again, in comparison, I'm just using another tote to try and give me, you know, a side-by-side, -side. gives us a little profile, and we're able to take a look at these guys and then determine whether or not we like it. And I do, so I think we're gonna call this one good. But we have one final step, and that is we've gotta open up this hole on the top, right, because our mounting pin goes all the way through. Now you might be tempted to mount this in a drill press upside down and just blow it out the top. We don't want to, you know, blow that out or, or chip it out. And I've also tried at times to mount this in a fixture and center it all up pretty and then drop, um, you know, a brad point bit into the top and open that up. And once again, if you catch this or if you're not perfectly fixtured and you're not held well, you're going to run the risk of tearing it out. So. With all the work that we've done, and we've done all this by hand at this point, I want to continue by hand. So one of the things that I've found to be very easy is just use a regular Dremel tool. We already have this cylinder. We know where the hole is located, right? It didn't move. And I'm just going to sneak in here with my Dremel tool, and I'm going to do this by hand and open that up. And then we'll just hand sand it, and we'll kind of hand grind it in and blend it, and it'll be just as good as new. Now, to help me with alignment, I often just use a dowel and that gives us a vector uh, to know where the hole is. My bench is made up of layers of maple plywood so it's easy for me to also use it kind of as a 
as a graph of, of its own. So I just line this guy up, I put my dowel straight away, and then I know exactly where I'm gonna hold my tool and we're gonna grind this out. And here we are, we've reached the end of our horn replacement video. I hope that you found this helpful and there was a few tips along the way uh, that you can apply at home. And um, just to recap, I think we did okay. I'm not gonna talk about finish uh, yet because we are gonna spend some time with that later in the series. But there it is, a simple horn repair, Bolivian rosewood on top of a Brazilian rosewood original Stanley tote. Uh, lots of years of service and I think it looks pretty good. Put that guy right back into service. So thanks for sticking around. I hope you'll give it a thumbs up. You'll subscribe and uh, you'll look forward to seeing the videos that I have put together next uh, regarding mid-body repair, grafting, and some of the other things that we're going to do as we uh, focus on ways to uh, preserve and restore or replace altogether original Stanley Rosewood totes. Thanks, guys.